So our Sunday school lesson again for today, the last lesson of the year, we will see that it is titled Chosen in Christ. And our lesson for this week, it takes us from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi to where we are now taking a look at Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus should be very familiar to us because I have referenced this church both in sermons and in a Bible study uh, recently this year, just a few months ago, in fact. The church of Ephesus is a very interesting church. It is a very interesting church from the standpoint that the church was made up of both Jews and Gentiles. The Jews, we again must understand, are those who could trace their lineage back to Judah, the son of Israel. And the Gentiles, they were everyone that could not do that thing. So this church, it was made up of both Jew and Gentile. And what we'll see here in the scripture of our lesson, our lesson for today is that there may have been a bit of conflict that was taking place in this church between both Jew and Gentile. Again, our lesson for today is chosen in Christ. And I want to put emphasis on that word chosen. Okay. So we, we have a church again, that was comprised of the Jews who were God's chosen people because they were of Israel. They were one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we have to remember that, that the Lord, he made a covenant with Abraham and that covenant, it was passed down from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, who was later named Israel. And that covenant was then passed down to the tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel with Judah being one of the tribes of Israel. And so you can imagine the conflict that would take place within this church between Jew and Gentile was that the Jews essentially believed themselves to be God's chosen people and they would look down on the Gentiles. You know, we, we have a people that say, hey, we're God's chosen people and you are not. It's likely the conflict that was taking place within, within this church. And so we'll see here in our lesson for today, that Paul, he essentially is going to be writing about who is God's chosen. It was made with, okay, it was made with Abraham initially, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was passed down, right, to Isaac. And then it, from Isaac, it was passed down to Jacob, who was later named. Israel. So Israel, all right, be very clear about that. Israel is God's chosen people, all 12 tribes of Israel. But again, when we look back at the history of Israel, we know that there was a divide, right? We know that 10 tribes, they moved and they became the Northern kingdom after Solomon's death. All right. During the reigns of David and Solomon, Israel, they were all 12 tribes were joined together as a people. But after their death, 10 tribes, they moved to the north. And then a couple of tribes, they stayed down in the south. With the south, those tribes primarily being Judah, the bigger tribe, and then Benjamin, the smallest of the tribes. The other tribes, they were to the north. The other tribes, the 10 tribes that was to the north was known as Israel. And then the ones that was to the south was essentially known as Judah, came the Jews, right? Now over, right. And then over time, the Levites, they came down from the Northern kingdom because of the wicked, the wickedness of the North, all right? So that's what occurred over time. And then again, as history would have it, we know that the Northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians, we know that the southern kingdom was conquered by the Babylonians. The, the northern kingdom, they never really fully came back. They, their blood was intermingled with Gentiles and they became 
the Samaritans. And we, we know that those who were exiled to Babylon, that they eventually returned from the Babylonian exile to be in the land of Judea in Jerusalem, right? And Jesus was eventually born, okay? But the Jews, again, they held on to that old tradition, all right? And so they saw themselves as God's chosen people. And so, again, we, we have a conflict, like I said, that was brewing within that church between essentially those who are Jews, who are of the blood of Israel, and then the Gentile believer that was in the church as well. OK, and so that's essentially, like I said, it's a conflict over who is God's chosen people. That's something that still actually uh, happens in the world today. We have a lot of people in the world today uh, that convert over to Judaism. Uh, they, they desire to be a Jew because they are of the belief that it makes them special in the eyes of God uh, to be a Jew. All right. But Paul, he, he speaks here again, chosen in Christ is the title of our lesson. So Paul, he has to essentially uh, calm down what could have potentially been a conflict within this church to speak on who is it that is God's chosen. All right. Chosen in Christ. So we'll see there in the opening verse of our lesson there in the third verse where Paul, he said, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So Paul, he praises God for, if you notice there, he praises God for how he has already blessed us. Okay. Look at, look at the, the wording there in the scripture. He said, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed. So we, we would look at that and we would see, you know, we would think that he's talking about past blessings, but I want you to understand that Paul is essentially saying that we are already blessed. Okay. We are, we were blessed yesterday, right? God blessed us yesterday, but he also blessed, he's blessed us right now, this very moment, right? And I want you to understand that the blessings that we will receive in the future, that they are already given to us as, as well. The Lord has blessed us this very moment, but we may not be able to perceive that blessing. We may not be able to understand that blessing, that blessing. It, it may not have been revealed to us. Okay. Notice there as well, he said, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. There are a lot of people that, that live saying, I hope that I go to heaven one day. But again, I have already shown you all where we are already in heaven. That has actually already been revealed to us in the book of Revelation. When, when we take a look at the 21st chapter of the book of Revelation, John said that he saw the new heaven coming down, right? He said, old things passed away, behold, everything has become new, right? And an angel in that passage, in that chapter, showed John the, the bride of the lamb, the lamb being Jesus Christ. And who is it that is the bride of the lamb? The church. That's us. The angel showed John us already in heaven. So like I said, we are already blessed. The only thing that we are doing is just walking on this journey. Okay. The blessings that, that we pray for right now, this very moment, God is already at work on those blessings. Okay. It's just a matter of us being able to go and receive that blessing. It's just a matter of us being able to perceive that blessing that blessing being revealed in our understanding. It's like the promised land. The promised land was always there for the children of Israel, right? That blessing was always there for them. They had to make the journey to that blessing. That's why you, you've heard me say this before as well uh, this year, that the blessings aren't going to always just come to us, right? They're not going to always just poof, pop up right there for us. 
On this journey, we literally are on a journey to where we have to go and take possession of our blessings at times on this journey. We have to do that as Israel did. Israel had to journey to the promised land, right? Then when they got there, they had to actually cross over the Jordan. They had to go in and take possession of the promised land. They had to go in and take possession of, of the blessing. Okay, that's, again, we are already blessed today, but, they, you know, we have to go and at times we have to, to work. We have to move towards that blessing. Okay, that blessing, you know, we have to, it may take time for it to be, revealed to us. Okay. So that was the opening there essentially uh, of Paul's uh, message here. Now we start to, to dig. Go ahead. Right. He's talking to the church. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Good point there. He's talking. He's not talking just to the Jews. He's a Jew. Okay. But that church, again, like I said, is made up of both Jew and Gentile. And so when he's saying us, he's talking about believers, sincere believers, all of those who genuinely believe in Christ in their hearts. That's who Paul is talking to brothers and sisters in Christ. He says us there because he's a fellow brother in Christ. Okay. So we'll see there in the fourth verse, let's take the fourth through the sixth verse there, because this all touches on, on the same thought here. So we'll see there in the fourth verse that Paul, said, just as he chose us again, there's that word us there. He said, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We'll see there in the fifth verse, the scripture, Paul says, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And then the sixth verse says to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. So Again, chosen in Christ. That's the title of our lesson there. Now, Paul, he, he, he brings up a word here that I want to discuss here for a moment. He said, having predestined. What does that word mean to you? What are your thoughts on predestination? Did beforehand. In the beginning. Good, good answer. Okay. You know, predestination, that is, that's something that has been predetermined. It talks about destiny. It talks about fate, your fate, our fate, right? So the thought of predestination, I believe, is honestly misunderstood in a manner of speaking because it, it raises questions quite a bit for, for many. To where some will say, for example, like Judas Iscariot, some will wonder whether or not it was his fate to betray Jesus. And so a lot of people, when they start to think about predestination, fate, right? Some believe that they don't have the chance to go to heaven. They believe that they're fated not to go to heaven. Whereas some believe that they are fated to go to heaven. Okay. When we start talking about fate and again, your future, there are many people that when predestination, that topic comes up, what you are destined to do, they believe that it takes away their free will, that it takes away their choice. And this is why many don't come to the Lord. They won't turn to the Lord because they believe that, uh, they don't have a free will, that they don't have freedom of choice to be able to choose and make decisions for themselves, which again, as you have heard me say again this year, that's a rather interesting statement to make considering that God gave us free will. Without the Lord, we, we wouldn't have free will. God is the one that gave us free will. We have the ability to choose because God made us in his image and in his likeness. 
So we are born with free will, the freedom of choice. That's something that, that we are all born with. So when Paul speaks about predestination here, it again, it also brings up the thought of who is it that has been chosen? Who is it that has been called by the Lord, right? And, and so we, we know that from, from study. You know that because you've heard me teach on this thought before. Like I said, I preached on this earlier this year as well. But again, many take that thought of many are called but they try to be exclusive with it. Like, like being called by God is an exclusive club to be in. Okay. Over in the eighth chapter of Romans, let's turn over to the eighth chapter of Romans for, for a moment here, because Paul, he, he spoke on this over in the eighth chapter of, of Romans. And when you get there, I want you to take a look at, We'll take a look at the 29th and the 30th verse there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Because again, there's this thought that only a select few have been chosen by the Lord. And so over in the 8th chapter of Romans, you, you have that? In the 29th and the 30th verse, we'll see that Paul, he wrote to the church that was in Rome, he said, for whom he foreknew, that's talking about the Lord, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, firstborn among many brethren. Then it says there in the 30th verse, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so again, Paul doesn't necessarily answer the question of who is it that has been called there. He just speaks about the predestination that God has predestined, that God has set forth for people to be conformed, Paul said there, to the image of his son. So he's talking about God, the father, all right, has set forth, he predestined that some, all right, be conformed to the image of his, his son. But again, who is it that has been called for us to answer that question as to who is it that has been called? We need to take a look at what J Jesus said to Nicodemus. So if we take a look at the third chapter of John's gospel and the 16th verse, we see a familiar verse that many, even those who are outside of the church, know what John 3.16 says. What is it that is said in the third chapter of John's gospel and the 16th verse? So who is it that Jesus, I want you to, I want you to understand that those are Jesus's words, not my words. Okay. Those are Jesus's words. Who is it that Jesus said God chose? Who is it that Jesus said God called in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse? What is whosoever believeth? So whoever believes in who? In God. in God, in Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave who? His only begotten son. That whoever or whosoever believes in the only begotten son will not perish, but have everlasting life. So again, who is it that God chose? He chose, did he not choose the world? He chose all, he chose the world and all who believe. So again, the invitation that is found in the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse, that verse that me and Unc, we always tell y'all, that's really all that anybody ever needs is the third chapter of John's gospel in the 16th verse. 
Jesus himself made it clear that it wasn't just Israel that God chose. Okay. To break it down to, again, what was taking place in the church of Ephesus with the Jews and the Gentiles, it wasn't just the Jews that God chose. Yes, they were initially chosen by the Lord. Israel, the 12 tribes, they were initially chosen by the Lord. When you take a look at the book of Exodus, when, when Moses and the children of Israel reached Mount Sinai, the Lord said to Moses that he desired to give his law to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel said, yes, after hearing, hearing the word of God, they said, yes, we will be obedient. Yes, this covenant, it sounds good. Again, they were chosen by the Lord, but Israel, they disobeyed. And it wasn't just at Mount Sinai where they made the calf of gold and, and they disobeyed. They, they rebelled against God when they initially were in the wilderness of Paran and could have crossed over into the promised land. They said, nope, don't want to do it. They listened to the word of those 10 spies, right? Then that generation passed away. They crossed over to Jordan. They was able to take the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. We went over that again this year as well, right? But again, like I said at the start, y'all weren't here for this. We talked about the divided kingdoms. We know that the Northern kingdom, the Southern kingdom were conquered. Okay. So again, they were conquered because Israel, they forsook the Lord. They lived in disobedience. They rejected God. Jesus was there in the flesh. Some followed him, but many rejected him. Okay. And so again, the word of God was opened up to everyone. Had the children of Israel been obedient to the law, they would have become a nation that was holy. They would have been like priests. They would have set the example for the world to follow. They would have essentially been what the church is supposed to be today. We are supposed to be stewards of the Lord. That means that we are supposed to be representatives of the Lord. So had Israel been obedient, they would have been, again, representatives of the Lord, an example for the world to follow in order to become holy and righteous. But they were unable to fulfill the law. And so Jesus was given. Okay. And he told Nicodemus that whoever believes in him will not perish, that God loved not just Israel, but that God loved the world. Therefore, everyone was chosen by the Lord. But Jesus, he said in the parable of the wedding feast, he said that familiar statement, many are called, but few are chosen. And, and that statement is one that has been so misunderstood. And because it's been so misunderstood, it's been misconstrued. Does anybody know what that statement means? Many are called, but few are chosen. Does anybody know what that statement means? What do y'all think? Many are called. What, what does that mean? Many are called. Well, I mean, think about what we just said from the third chapter of Genesis Gospel in the 16th verse. What does it mean that many are called? That everyone is called, uh, called by God. Everyone is called by God. Again, we know this because God loved the world, right? But, but then to tie in, few are chosen. What does that mean? Did God only choose a few? How, how could that be possible, right? Because we said that, that he loved the world. He gave the world his only begotten son, which would mean that, that he called the world. But how is only a few chosen? What does that mean? You raise your hand. Only those that believe. You said not everybody believes. See, God, essentially, he picked up the phone, right? You know, and, you know, today, I, 
I don't know if people still send out mass text messages. They used to do it. Me and my brother was joking about this on Christmas. They used to do it years ago, back in the MySpace years. Y'all don't know what that is, but that was back in like 2006 or so. They would send, we, we, we broke away from doing that because we have social media now. And so you can just hop on Facebook or on Instagram or, or Twitter or whatever and just say, hey, Merry Christmas. And everybody that want to respond, they can respond, right? But God... He called, he picked up the phone, he called out to the world. He gave the world his only begotten son, his word, okay? That's what Jesus, John said in the first chapter of John's gospel, the first verse, we went over this in, in our Sunday school lesson for Christmas, right? The word was made flesh. Initially, God gave his word on stone tablets to, to Israel, right? But, but again, the word was made flesh, OK, dwelt among his people and and called out. All right. Jesus, he shared a word with the world. Y'all know what that word is, right? That that we are sinners that need to live in repentance. OK, but John said only a few received him. That's what he said in the first chapter of John's gospel. So Jesus said a word. He called out to the world to repent. All right. He rebuked the world. The Lord still rebukes the world today, but only a few, only a few are heeding his rebuke and living in repentance. Only a few are doing that. So many are called. The world is called, but only a few answer the call. OK, so I want to be very clear about this. God chose everybody. OK, he chose everybody, but everybody does not choose him. That's what that statement actually means. OK, and the parable of the wedding feast, which you can find in the 22nd chapter of Matthew's gospel, it, it, it speaks to that because at the uh, wedding feast, the, 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 the hall was filled with some wearing the proper garments. But then the master that was at the wedding feast, which was representative of the Lord, noticed that somebody wasn't dressed properly. And so that somebody that wasn't dressed properly was kicked out of the wedding feast. Many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called by the Lord. The world was called by God, but only a few of us have answered that call. And so that's that's the point that Paul makes there. Uh, in the 29th verse there, he said, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We have to remember that God created man in his image and in his likeness. He didn't create us to be sinners. As I said, back in March, God created mankind with the intent of dwelling with mankind. We had glory. We were created in glory. We lost that glory when, when we sinned in the garden. Okay. But again, the Lord put it in place, his only begotten son in place so that we can regain what was lost, right? So that we can dwell with him. So again, that was the predestined part there. All right. Said he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And again, there in the 30th verse, he said, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. He's talking about there, Paul is talking about believers there, okay? And again, y'all weren't here for this, but I talked about what was possibly taking place within the church of Ephesus, may have been a conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles, where the Jews that were in that church were likely looking down on the Gentiles because they were God's chosen people. And so the message that Paul has shared so far in the 28th verse through the 30th verse there is that all people were chosen by God. Okay. He wanted to make it very clear that all people were chosen by the Lord. Jesus, he said it himself in the 10th chapter of John's gospel and the 16th verse. He said that there were other sheep of the fold that he needed to go and to receive. 
He said that to Jews. The other sheep that Jesus was talking about were Gentiles. And Jesus said that he would be the shepherd over one flock, not two flocks. And Jesus didn't say that he would be the shepherd over the Jews and the Gentiles separately, set apart. He said that the Jew and the Gentile would be together in one fold, that he would be the shepherd over that fold, that one flock. Okay. So Jew and Gentile, we are one. Okay. And like I said, there are many people today in the world who convert over to Judaism. All right. And I'm not, I want to be clear that I'm not talking bad about anyone, but there are many people that do it because they believe that it makes them more special in God's eyes. God doesn't have favorites. Okay. He's not a, a biased God. All right. James said it himself, the Lord is without partiality. Okay. So, you know, if you are Jew, that's fine. If you are Gentile, it's fine. So long as you are of faith, if you're of faith, you will not perish. You will have everlasting life. Okay. All right. So again, let me get back over here to Ephesians. All right. And we had, we had made it down to the sixth verse, right? All right. So we'll see there in the seventh verse, We'll see there that Paul, he said to those who are of that church, he said, in him, we have redemption through his blood. All right. The him that he's talking about there is Christ. All right. We just, you know, we just went over this as well. He said in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. We'll see there in the eighth verse that Paul, he continued on, he said, which he made to abound toward us. Okay. There's that word again, us, the us there again, I want you to understand is speaking to both Jew and Gentile. He's talking to the sincere believers. He's talking to and about all believers. Okay. Which he made abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. All people have the opportunity to be redeemed. Okay. I want to be very clear about this. All people have the opportunity to be redeemed, no matter your walk of life. If you have faith in the only begotten son, his shed blood will redeem you. Okay. So again, John three sixteen tells us whosoever or whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. It didn't just say, White people, it didn't just say black people, it didn't just say Mexicans, Asians, it didn't just say Jew, okay? It said whosoever, okay? No matter your race, no matter your culture, okay, you can be redeemed. We'll see there as we continue on there. In the ninth verse, we'll see there, Paul said, having made known to us the mystery of his will, Christ Paul is saying there made known the mystery of the Lord's will. Of course he made it known. Christ is God in the flesh. Does anybody know what the will of God is? It has been revealed to us. Do you know what the will of God is? I've spoken on this before. What is the will of the Lord? Okay, for us to be with him. All right. Any other thoughts? What is the will of the Lord? Hmm? For us to do his will. For us to do his will. All right. And so again, what is his will? Sure, I gave y'all the answer. I was just trying to see if y'all had anything else to add on to it. You see, in the sixth chapter of John's Gospel. To be a part of him. There we go. He wanted everybody to, to be a part of him. Somebody turn over to the sixth chapter of John's Gospel in the 40th verse. So I want to show that this is based on sound doctrine, what the will of the Lord is. 
And, and I want you to understand that these words are according to Christ himself, God in the flesh. Uh, the sixth chapter of John's gospel and the 40th verse. Uh, I just want, I want this to be, I just want to show the sound doctrine here so that again, this doesn't come off as we're making up something. This is Christ speaking. Okay. And Christ again is God in the flesh. What does it say in the sixth chapter of John's gospel and the 40th verse? Okay. So again, every one. Okay. Again, the title of our lesson is chosen in Christ. We're talking about God's chosen. God's chosen to be very clear here. Yes. Israel was a Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, the twi the 12 tribes of Israel. Yes. They're God chosen people, but guess who else is God's chosen people? Everyone, specifically those who choose to believe in him. Okay. If you are of faith, all right, you are a treasure in God's eyes. Don't ever let someone tell you otherwise. Okay. All right. So again, we'll see there in the... 10th verse said that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one, all things in Christ. That goes back to what I referenced. Okay. That goes back to what I referenced from the 10th chapter of John's gospel. Everyone, Jew and Gentile is going to be together. Right? Those who are of sincere faith. Okay. And then he said there uh, in the 11th verse, he said, in him also, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined. Again, there goes that word and to be predestination. We said was what, what is predestination all about? Okay. Well, something being predetermined. Okay. God's will has always been this. Okay. This inheritance that we see here. Okay. He said in him, we also have, and we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. All right. What is the inheritance that we have attained? Eternal salvation, eternal life. eternal life. Okay. That, that is what has been predetermined for us. Again, like I said, and I'm not sure if you all were here for this, but in the first chapter of Genesis, the 26th verse, the Lord, when he created mankind, he created us in his image and in his likeness. We were created in glory. Okay. We were already at the start, holy and righteous, but but that was lost due to sin. Okay. So the Lord again created us for the purpose of dwelling with us. He's only going to dwell with that, which is holy and righteous. He's not going to dwell with sin. And so when Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, they were exiled from the garden. You and I today, we live in exile in a manner of speaking. And what I mean by that is that we live in this world today and not with the Lord in heaven. We are in heaven. This world is not heaven. Heaven can't be found in this world. We say it all the time that this world is getting worse and worse all the time. And I know I'm not making that up. Okay. That's what we say all the time. All right. So y'all have heard me say this again throughout this year, which is why I said this lesson is a perfect lesson to end this year off with because it essentially just talking to things, points that I've made throughout this year. Okay. We essentially have a passport in this world. All right. We said this a few weeks ago, we aren't citizens in this world. 
This world is just a temporary place. All right. You are either going to have citizenship in heaven or citizenship set apart from the Lord in the place that we call hell. Okay. I much rather my citizenship be in heaven. I don't want to be apart from the Lord. So I do my very best. And I want you to understand I ain't perfect. I say it all the time. Okay. I'm not ashamed to admit that I'm not perfect. All right. But I do my best to live for Christ so that I can take my citizenship card from the Lord and enter into the kingdom of heaven, his kingdom. That's where I want my license, my citizenship card to be at when all things are said and done. So in him also we have obtained an inheritance an inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. We have been chosen and called to be saved by the Lord, right? That was predetermined by the Lord. When, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the Lord didn't just simply let it go. He told the serpent right there, the serpent being the devil, that he would be defeated. His head would be bruised. And again, we know that it was Christ that did that. When he died on the cross and shed his blood for us, he became our propitiation, our atonement offering, right? And through his death and through his resurrection, through the receiving of the Holy Spirit, our salvation, it is sealed. Okay. And, and our salvation will lead us back to obtaining that holiness and righteousness, that glory that we were created in. Okay. Y'all following along with me. So when we talk about that inheritance, that's what it's all about. It ain't just about the kingdom of heaven. It's about us attaining that holiness and that righteousness, putting on that, that body that is incorruptible. Paul said that glorious body. I don't know about all of you, but I can't wait to shed this body of mine. You know, my kidneys tried to take me out years ago. And, and, and thankfully, because of medicine and the Lord again being with me, I was able to get that transplant a couple of years ago. And I'm able to stand before all of you and I don't have to go on dialysis every day. OK, but again, I, I, I can't wait to put off this body. I love this body of mine. It has brought me a long way. You know, it endures, you know, but. But this body, eventually, it will fade away. And the same will be said for all of you as well. We don't know when our clock will run out. And that, that, that's a very sad thing uh, to say that, you know, unfortunately, we're getting older and older. You know, tomorrow will be the start of another year, you know. Andrew, he already done crossed over into 40. And, and when the next year come in, I'll be sitting there knocking on the door of it. My last year of the 30s. You know, we, we you know, we, me and my brother, we was talking about this uh, a while ago. That when we were little, it seemed like time was, was so slow. You know, it, it, we would always be looking forward to Christmas. And it would seem like the closer and the closer and closer we would get to Christmas, it seemed like, you know, time would slow down. But we was talking about how now that we have gotten older, time goes by so fast. Christmas is just in a blink of an eye, you know. It, we're in December today, and I promise you, December next year, if we are blessed to still be able to be here on December 31st of, of 2024, we'll be remembering this moment like it was yesterday. And, and we were saying, me and my brother was saying that, you know, the older and older it gets, time goes by quicker because we can sense the clock is ticking on us. And we know that, that unfortunately, the end is coming closer and closer and closer as we're doing nothing but working our way towards that end. But as sad as life coming to an end, physical life coming to an end will be, spiritual life will just only be beginning. That spiritual life is eternal. And the Lord has said that he has predestined us for greatness. I don't know if y'all remember me preaching the sermon to be great. Okay. 
but we are predestined to be great. And to be great, I'm not talking about obtaining the riches of this world. I'm talking about attaining the inheritance of heaven that God has for us. So this year we strove towards the kingdom of heaven, right? Next year, let us continue to strive towards the kingdom of heaven. Okay. And so we'll see there that Paul, he said there in closing there in the 13th, in the 14th verse, it said, in him, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in him, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. I just mentioned that. Okay. Salvation we know cannot be lost. Yes, we are going to go before the judgment seat of Christ as, as Paul wrote of in the third chapter of first Corinthians. When we go before the judgment seat of Christ, we will come under the fire of the judgment seat of the judgment of Christ, I should say. Okay. And y'all may recall me speaking on this scripture as well this year, that our works are going to be judged by the Lord, good or bad. When you are of sincere faith and your salvation has been sealed, you are going to be saved. Okay. You will be rewarded with the kingdom of heaven. Those works who, those whose works are not consumed by the fire, they will receive an extra reward. Those who works may be consumed by the fire. The fire will purify them and they will be saved there. Nobody who is of sincere faith is going to be booted and kicked out of heaven. Okay. Your salvation, it has been sealed. And so he said there in the 14th verse, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So again, the, the, the point of this, this message that Paul was sharing to the church of Ephesus was essentially to bring the Jews and the Gentiles that was in that church together. Because again, like I said, they're not saying that all the Jews in the church was doing this. It may have just been a few that was in the church that was doing this. But it was likely a conflict between Jew and the Gentile in that church with the Jews looking down on the Gentiles, with the Jews saying, hey, we are, you know, we are more special because we are, we are the chosen people. And yes, they, they are the chosen people of the Lord. But to be clear, everyone is the chosen people of the Lord. And you all become special when, again, we are all of sincere faith in the Lord, okay? So Jew or Gentile, Paul said it don't matter, all right? You are saved through faith, all right? So that is our lesson for today, chosen in Christ. That is the last lesson of the quarter. I feel like many people, they need to be attentive, especially to this word, and especially uh, within the church as well, because you know there are many church-going folk, right? Church-going folk. I want y'all to, to hear me on that. That like to look down on other people in, in their walk of life. They believe that because they got up and they sat down in a chair in front of the church and they profess, "Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk by faith." They profess, hey, I believe in Christ. They believe that that makes them more special than anybody else. When the fact of the matter is that anybody can come up and sit in front of the church and say, hey, I believe. Okay. It's another thing to then actually walk by faith. There's a difference between the professed believer and the sincere believer. Okay. And so there are many people today, like I said, there are many people who get looked down on, made to feel like they can't have a part in heaven because they may be a sinner. But again, Jesus said that all can come to him. Whosoever believes in him can have their sins washed away. So nobody should ever feel like they aren't worthy of salvation when the fact of the matter is that God has said that all people are worthy of salvation, okay? So that's something that we should keep in mind. Never look down on anybody, all right? Y'all have heard me say that time and time again. We as believers, we are to be lowly, we are to be humble, and we are to uplift all people that are around us.
Thanks for watching this week's Sunday School lesson. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I hope that you'll share this lesson with someone somewhere. Now, if you haven't done so already, I ask all of you to, to follow our channel. Be sure that you follow this channel so that you don't miss a Sunday School lesson, so that you don't miss a Bible study, so that you don't miss a sermon or a food for thought. Be sure that you are following this channel today.